On today's episode of Uncommon Sense, we have the pleasure of being joined again by Dr. Eric Demuse, the headmaster for Chesterton Academy of Milwaukee. We will talk with him about the importance of education, specifically in the realm of the Chesterton Academy. Stay tuned. That's coming up. A very good welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us on Uncommon Sense, the official podcast of the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. My name is Albert Sines, and as I mentioned in the intro, we are joined by the fantastic, the wonderful, the incredible, I don't know how many great adjectives I can use here, uh, Eric Demuse, uh, headmaster of Chesterton Academy of Milwaukee. Hello. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Albert. Thanks for the warm welcome. It's always a delight to be here uh, on this podcast. Uh, thanks for having me on again. So glad to have you. Well, let's kind of get into it. Uh, you know, from a time standpoint, we are coming off of a very good uh, Giving Tuesday, and we were emphasizing the importance of Chesterton Academy and you know, our theme was forming saints for a brighter future. And I think that is a very good synopsis of what a Chesterton Academy is trying to do, not just form students for the immediate, for the for the next month, but really looking towards the long term for the future. Can you sort of intro here with why? that is a good theme, a good motto for Chesterton Academy and what it is trying to do with its students? Absolutely. I mean, the mission of Chesterton Academy is to form saints and leaders, right? people who are going to go out into the world and be missionaries of the gospel, people who are going to go out in the world and be leaders in the public square and leading the public discourse uh, in our nation and in the world. And this is really essential to what the work that we do here. I think sometimes parents don't realize how important the high school decision is. You know, when we look at the numbers and the research numbers about when young people are leaving the Catholic faith, we're seeing that these numbers are not often when they're in college. It's actually when they're 13, 14, 15 years old. So we really stress to families that the decision of where you send your child to high school is the most important decision you will make as a parent, even more important than the decision of where they're going to go to college. And with that, we take the work that we do very, very seriously. You know, we think it's very, very important to form the spiritual side of the student, very important to form the heart of the student and their moral character, and very important to form the mind. And I think sometimes we don't give as much credence as we ought to, to the work of intellectual formation and the way that our mind should be formed. You know, when we think about how we operate in the world, you know, let's take, for example, one of the things that's kind of on the rise currently, especially in the kind of post-pandemic years here, is a rise that we're seeing in young people of mental health, right? And oftentimes we can associate this very closely with um, kind of uh, emotional health or emotional disorders. But, but again, we have to remember the title is, it refers to the mind, to mental health, right? And there's this sense in which the way that we think about the world around us is going to affect the way that that world impacts us and that we impact that world. Uh, when we fear something, fear is not just an emotional response to something. It's also an emotional response to an intellectual idea about what's coming. When we see a scary movie clip or something like that, we mentally know what's coming and we get, we get afraid. And so we think it's really, really important to form students' minds well, because we think that this is going to help them to become great saints and leaders in the public square. And by doing that, by providing this solid foundation of mind, heart, and spirit, what we're doing is we're saying by the end of these four years, a student is going to be able to go off and do anything that they desire to do and anything that the Lord calls them to be, whether that could be going on to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, whether it means going on to be priests and religious, um, that we think this foundation really sets students up well to go out into the public sphere and be leaders. So let, let's talk about that public sphere for, for a moment. What would you say, in your opinion, would you say that it is a severe lack of proper mental intellectual formation that sort of has affected a great amount of sort of today's workforce? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in large part, we have to recognize that ideas have consequences. And so when we look at 
the, throughout our history, right? The history of, of the world and especially the history of the West. Um, when we look at our own country, we're going to recognize that certain ideas uh, have consequences and they have consequences for the way things play out in our culture and in our society. Now, that's going to be for, for good, uh, can be for ill. And it's something that we need to be aware of is what are those ideas and how are those kind of impacting this, this discourse? So I do think it's really essential uh, for young people's minds to be formed appropriately. But of course, with that, um, you know, we don't want a bunch of really, really smart, evil people. Um, that, that can be toxic as well. And so sure. what we really want is people whose hearts are formed as well, uh, who have the courage to share those ideas and let those ideas actually have consequences in the public sphere, uh, who are taking these ideas to prayer, right? Who are doing the, the work of the intellect on their knees. Um, all these things go hand in hand for kind of true flourishing in, in, in the public sphere. So I like what you said there. You said about sort of going out there and taking this intellectual for formation, but also taking it out there on the knees. So obviously there is a strong tie between sort of the necessity of faith, the necessity of prayer, not just, well, we're gonna fill your mind with a lot of great ideas, go out and make it happen. You have to go out there and you have to, you gotta get down, you, you have to pray, you have to bring God along with you on the journey. Have, have you been able to sort of, uh, track that from the time of sort of getting into Chesterton Academy and seeing how that combination of intellectual formation plus faith has benefited the students that have gone on and graduated? Absolutely. Because I think, you know, oftentimes, one, and I think this is one of kind of the, um, one of the things that is in need of great reform kind of in, in Catholic education is that kind of the religious aspect has been kind of relegated to one thing among many. Uh, one subject among many, rather than recognizing Christ as kind of the grounding force of all of our knowledge, um, that the world is, is given to us and created by God. It's revealed to us through his son and that through him, we can know more about the world in all its various areas. And we can know more about the one who created this world. And so I think seeing Christ as sort of this grounding force of everything that we do and such an integral part of our work, everything from students going to daily mass, to prayer uh, to begin and end every class, to the Angelus and meal prayer at the, at the middle of the day, to the end of the day when we pray an examination of conscience and the doxology. All of these things kind of go together to have this sort of way of life that we're introducing the students to that we want them to take with them. And we're seeing it. I mean, it's been beautiful for me to receive testimonies back from our graduates who are off at college and they're sending me emails saying, you know what? I'm still going to daily mass and I'm, it's not forced. I don't have to, but I just, I want to, it's an integral part of my day. Um, I, I've, I've learned over the four years that I can't live without it. I mean, if I had a dollar for, for every student who came in to a Chester Academy saying, I'm not, I'm not that excited about going to daily mass. And by senior year, they love it. And it's one of the most essential parts of their day. Um, I might not have to work anymore, right? I mean, this is something that it's, <laughs> it's really rich to see this transformation. It's a slow transformation. And I think that's, that's oftentimes what people forget, right? We're eager for a quick fix. Education plays a long game. When we're forming minds and hearts, right? We're investing in these young people and it's a long game. That that return, it might not come for a while, right? That that return might be something that the students are gonna go through lots of ups and downs of life. Like we've all experienced times where they feel close to the Lord, far from the Lord, times when they're doing well, times when they're struggling. Um, but this investment, we feel like when you when you plant this there, right? That among it's kind of like planting good seed and caring for it. That among all the kind of the vicissitudes of 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 of, of the weather and all these things that might happen, that it can still grow and flourish. Um, and I think that's the work that we're doing, and we're seeing it in our graduates and in the work that they're doing in the world. So let's talk a little bit about the specificness of what's happening at a Chesterton Academy. All right, so we've established that there's a lot of intellectual formation. We've established that. Christ is sort of the basis that wraps all of this up and that you, you cannot move forward without Christ being there to lead the way. But what about the parts of the academy that aren't necessarily based out of the Socratic method or a philosophical book or math uh, or going to daily mass? But, you know, part of the academy is uh, a heavy investment into sort of the arts. You know, we have ballroom dancing. We have choir. Uh, does does that play equally a role in the formation of these students? You know, for their for their future. 
Absolutely. And I think this is sometimes something people people forget. You know, oftentimes these subjects, these these arts, these fine arts are kind of relegated to specials in, in grade schools. Um, here, they're core subjects among math, science, philosophy, history, literature, theology, etc. We consider these to be core subjects. We consider these to be essential learning for young people because it exposes them, number one, to beauty. It exposes them to the power that beauty has through whether it be music, uh, whether it be a painting, whether it be the stage, uh, whether it be beautiful dance. Uh, it exposes them to this. And oftentimes, I think there's, right, Dostoevsky said famously, beauty will save the world. Um, and I think it's something where where beauty is one of those things that draws people in. People are attracted to joy. They're attracted to beauty. And it can be a great evangelization tool. Uh, but it also forms students in really profound ways. Um, I've noticed it with students who come in and who they would, they would never sing in a choir. They would never be on stage unless they were forced to. And they do it, and they're very good at it, and they fall in love with it. Uh, we've had students who've come in and they've been very kind of STEM focused and I want to go on and do, do engineering and math science. They've had to take an art class and they loved it. And all of a sudden they go on to college and the careers where they're integrating, you know, arts and math and science and engineering and these kind of all these kind of new disciplines that are coming out. And so what we've seen is the way that this impacts students and then it helps them to kind of fall in love with these things and it forms them in a lot of ways. In the very least, I always say, for students learning how to sing, I always tell them, you know, in the very least, this is important because when you grow up and you get married and you have kids, the first voices they're going to hear singing to them are yours. So make sure those are good voices. Make sure those are beautiful voices. And to be honest, if at the end of the day, that's all your voice gets used for is to sing to your children, then it's certainly worth it. Yes, I, I agree. I, I could have... I, I could have stood to benefit my children more had I potentially had such a good <laughs> emphasis on singing when I was younger. Um, you know, I I think about beauty and the the real impact that it has. And the problem is, right, is some people want to sort of, they want to say it's subjective. And to a certain degree, I believe that it is. But I think they're much like the the very solid sort of doctrine, the dogma of our faith, which is sort of unshakable. I believe that there are some elements to beauty which are not sort of subjective. Like, I, I cannot say to someone, I think you're going to walk into St. Peter's Basilica and you're not going to be impressed, right? Like, it's just going to be a beautiful experience. You know, obviously going into the Sistine Chapel, like, don't walk in there and tell me it's not beautiful. Like it is. Now you might force, you know, you you might force your yourself to say, "Nah, I don't like this." Okay, but I think that the inner soul is de designed by God to recognize that which is beautiful. So maybe someone doesn't understand the feeling that's going on inside because they've never been so, you know, they've never been subjected to anything really truly beautiful. But to put an emphasis on it from the standpoint of the arts and to form and cultivate that within the students. I can only imagine sort of the dividends that it pays to be out in the world amongst people that maybe don't have that kind of formation. They went through a standard general formation, avoided the arts, and say, hey, there's something else beautiful. Like you're, the, the students from a Chester Academy can impact the world and say there's more beauty than what you think is beautiful. Yeah, and I think that's essential, right? Like as you said, there there is this kind of intuitive sense that we have as human beings. It's it's not a coincidence that most people really appreciate symmetry. Um, that's not just a rare kind of you know odd. Uh, thing of the universe. I think it's because there's something about symmetry. There's something about balance um, where people are attuned to it in certain ways that it's appealing to the eyes, it's appealing to the senses. And so I think there is this sense that we want to kind of train students and to kind of focus in on these sort of areas, these natural kind of intuitions that they have toward the beautiful. But what, like you pointed out, what this also does is it makes students attuned to finding the beautiful even in unexpected places. And I think this is one of the most important things when we think about forming leaders to go out into the world is that it's not helpful to form leaders who are glum, who are sad, who are prophets of the end times, who are constantly bemoaning the culture, the culture, the culture, right? As St. Augustine beautifully reminds us, right? We can bemoan the times, but we are the times. And such as we are, that's how the times will be. And so it's really, really important to form students who not only recognize a beautiful painting on a wall, or who not only recognize a beautiful polyphonic piece in a church, but who can go out into the messiness of the world and recognize the beauty therein. 
I think that's one of the most important things that we help students to do is to be attentive to those areas because recognizing that is essential and it's important to have the eyes to do it. And at the end of the day, when they leave here and they go on to college and they go on to work and they go on to their vocations, it's going to be hard. It's hard here and it's going to be hard as they, they move on in the world. There's going to be times when in their marriages or in their work, things are going to be difficult. It might be hard for them to find the beautiful in the messiness, um, but that's what we invite them to do on a daily basis. Uh, St. Francis Xavier famously said to his missionaries who were going overseas, he said, yes, study books. But more importantly, study the book of sinners, study those people who you are encountering to seek the beauty they're in, to be grateful for them and to help lead them to Jesus Christ. And I think that's part of what we're attuning their minds and hearts to do is, is see the beauty out there uh, wherever it can be found. And I think that's that's a beautiful point that St. Francis Xavier made, like to look for that beauty in the person. And I think a lot of and it's not across the board, but I think that a lot of students come out from what we will again call a standard education, and they're sort of made to really think about themselves. It's sort of a, a selfish, you know, output. All right, you're going to come, you're going to get to education, you're going to graduate. You need to think about yourself. You need to think about where you're going. You think about going to college. You need to think about your your career. You need to think about yourself. Everything about you, versus, hey, when you leave school. It's not just about you. It is about the rest of the people that you have to encounter. And there is something worthwhile inside of those people. I mean, I think that we can see very easily from Scripture and from Christ's teachings, like he was no stranger to the charity that he gave to everyone and the beauty that he saw in, you know, obviously in those who he healed who were not considered by society to be the beautiful people uh, of the times. So I, it, what a wonderful sort of testament to the way that Chesterton can sort of help the students go out into the world and not be selfish. Bingo. And I think there's something about, um, you know, sometimes people ask, well, how, how, how exactly do we do that? Right. And I think sometimes the mindset is, well, the best way for people to be able to find beauty in messiness is almost to kind of surround them with, with a lack, a paucity of beauty so that they're forced to look for it. I think actually it oftentimes works in reverse, that if we kind of give students this sort of, uh, this almost, we can call it a density of beauty, right? We're surrounding them on a daily basis with beautiful music, beautiful art, beautiful theater, beautiful ideas, beautiful thoughts, right? All of these things, when there's this sort of density of beauty around them, then I think it actually attunes their minds and their hearts to be attentive to the various ways that beauty manifests itself to us so that when they go out in the world, they're going to be attuned and they're going to pick it up where they might not otherwise pick it up. You know, one of my, uh, uh, my, my wife gives me a little bit of a hard time for this. One of my, one of my favorite music pieces is Stravinsky's The Firebird Suite. And The Firebird has, has lots of dissonance throughout it, but you could pick up this thread of kind of a beauty and harmony kind of underlying the whole piece until the very end when that, that kind of harmonious point kind of breaks free of the dissonance in the firebird. And that's kind of what I often think about is sort of, we have to be attuned to sort of that, that, that harmony kind of underlying certain things and, and be, be attentive to that. But the only way to be attentive to that is to first be exposed to that in a very kind of dense form. So let's talk now about the Chesterton Academy as a whole compared to, um, other educational options. And I want to make sure that I'm being very clear that I am not throwing any other education option under the bus. Uh, I know that a lot of good people have gone through other school systems, whether it's private, whether it's public, whether, you know, homeschooling, all of those have their potentials for greatness. But let's try to do a general comparison. Uh, Chesterton himself said uh, once, he said, the one thing that is never taught by any chance in the atmosphere of public schools is this, that there is a whole truth of things, and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. So he basically says that there's a lot of truth missing from a lot of the other educational systems. Can you sort of speak to that point as what Chesterton, uh, what the Chesterton Academy does compared to the other school options? Absolutely. I think part of kind of our nature as human beings is to try to put a whole picture of reality together 
in our minds. I think we do this starting at a very young age as children. When I have, I have, uh, I have five little children and, and when I ask them questions, they'll, they'll, they'll try to come up with an answer to explain how the world works. And if they don't have an answer, they're very quick to ask why. So the children between the ages of two and four ask over 40,000 questions, right? They're very eager to figure out the world around them and to fit it together in neat pieces. I remember the first time we did the uh, the tooth fairy with my oldest son and uh, we, we, we put his tooth under the pillow and we explained to him the tooth fairy is going to come. And it was hilarious to see his mind at play and he was kind of weirded out by it. He's like, dad, so a fairy is going to come in my room tonight? And like, how long is the fairy going to be here? And what is a fairy? You know, he was very con concerned about this, but he wanted to put the whole picture to get. So we ditched the tooth fairy after that. <laughs> uh, but he wanted to put the whole picture together. And I think we as human beings, we always want to do this. You know, um, when we all sit down at, at Thanksgiving or at Christmas with family, right? And we talk about, right? They always say, never talk about religion and politics. Uh, but you bring those up and everyone has an opinion about it. And I think that's part of the beautiful thing about being a human being is that those things that are essential to who we are as human beings, regardless of our training, regardless of our societal status, we all have an opinion about it because we want to be able to put a picture together of what the world is. That's what we're doing at Chesterton Academy. Through the kind of wide variety of disciplines that we're, we're exposing the students to, the goal is that the lines between these disciplines blur and that the students start to see the truth as one whole picture. They start to see the ways that things fit together. And I think that's really how life is. When we sit down at Thanksgiving or Christmas with family, we don't say, okay, for the first 30 minutes, we're going to talk about history. And then we're going to talk about math for 30 minutes. And then we're going to talk about chemistry for like, we don't break up the day, like, or the, break up the, the dinner conversation like that at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yes, we break up the day like that at, at Chesterton Academy, but because all the subjects are integrated, students, the lines between them blur. I'll frequently have students come into my classroom and say, Dr. Demuse, I can't remember if we were talking about this in literature or if it was history class or if it was philosophy class, but, and at the end of the day, of course, it doesn't matter which class they talked about it in. It's the, what matters is that they talked about it and that they're engaging this idea and that they're seeing this whole picture of reality, which ultimately makes us happy as human beings who desire to know things. And in knowing things, we don't desire just to know fun little facts. We don't desire actually to be kind of human Googles who can just come up with facts very quickly. We actually desire to have a coherent vision of reality and a coherent vision of our life. It's that coherent vision that we delight in and it ultimately makes us happy at the end of the day, uh, which is why I think the church is often, you know, has traditionally called heaven the beatific vision, right? And an intellectual vision of God because it's sort of, we, 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 um, there's an understanding that takes place in which we delight. But, you know, what about that aspect from the quote about truth? Why is the truth so important to these students so that they can come out and that they are formed appropriately to be able to have these discussions around Thanksgiving dinner, we'll say? Like, where does the truth really play into the, the larger game here or the long game, as you said er earlier, compared to some other educational option where... The truth is not so important as your own truth, as compared to this relativistic view that we want to let everyone sort of have your own truth. How does the truth compare from Chesterton compared to everyone else's? Yeah, I think, you know, the goal, right, the goal of what we do in the classroom all the time is we're pursuing the truth. And, and what does that mean? And how is the truth pursued? Again, that's going to be an important aspect where we always encourage students, we say, look, Every question is on the table, every opinion's on the table, and the classroom is our public square where we debate these ideas and we seek the truth together. And I think that's a really important thing because the truth is not afraid, right? When we stand in the truth, we can stand fearless. Um, what we often can see kind of now and what is sort of um, happening in some ways is that I think in large part, there's a way in which uh, the public discourse has shifted in some ways from a relativism to almost a, a sort of dogmatic fundamentalism about certain ideas. And that these are the things that you're allowed to say and hold in the public square, and you're not allowed to say other things. And if you say those other things, we're gonna try to get rid of you because we're afraid of those ideas. We're afraid of those, those, those topics. Um, I think the way that we pursue the truth is entirely different. The truth can only be pursued in freedom. 
that's how the truth is is pursued. And it's usually lies and deceit that have to operate through kind of pushing people out of the way, canceling things, crushing things, right? This is this is sort of how how tyrannical regimes throughout history, how they've tended to operate is that they operate in a sense of power and inflicting fear on others. And there's no sense of the freedom of pursuing truth. That's the work that we do here is that it's, we find it essential that the goal here is pursuing the truth. And sometimes that's going to be uncomfortable to us. Oftentimes it actually will be uncomfortable to us. Uh, sometimes it's going to be something that we don't like. Um, but nevertheless, it's essential for us to do it because it's really the only way to flourish is by pursuing that truth. And I think that's the key. One of the key things is that we explain this. We walk students through this in the classroom. We say, here's the process by which we're going to pursue the truth. And we have to recognize that, you know, this isn't an, an attack on, on you and your person, all of these things, but the goal is to come to a true understanding of the way things actually are in the world and that what we think they are or our perceptions of them aren't always actually how they are and that there's more freedom in actually seeing things as they truly are um, than in hunkering down with our own opinions. You know, the world has talked about freedom for a lot of things, especially, you know, within the last several decades, uh, freedom to choose, freedom to believe what you want, freedom to basically be anyone you want to be. Uh, it's very clear. And, you know, I heard a speech that was given probably a couple of decades ago. It was a series by Father Dave Pavanka from Franciscan University. And he gave this long series on freedom. And he talked about real freedom was not sort of bound up in basically the sin of the world. Like real freedom was found within Christ and his teachings to be able to be free of the bonds of, of, of sin, you know, basically that we become a slave to and to really be free to live a life uh, that that sort of separates us from all the basically terrible things of the world, but we've we've sort of we've sort of askewed freedom. We've made it something completely different. And what the world wants to sort of tell us to subscribe to is freedom, isn't really freedom. It's it's really chains. It's really a cage, and. It, it's it's peaceful to know that you know Chesterton academies are working to sort of free the students in in the realest and best sense of the word. Yeah, I think this is right. Freedom helps us to see things that we didn't think were possible before. Uh, the juniors are reading uh, Athanasius on the Incarnation right now, and at the end, Athanasius talks about how in Christ, Christ has made possible things that the pagan world couldn't even fathom, the resurrection of the body, perpetual virginity, right? These ideas of that the, the pagan world, even in its wildest imaginings, couldn't fathom are made possible through Christ and through the grace of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a really key thing that we look at is sort of freedom, uh, as Bishop Barron once said, freedom is the chastening of our desires to make the good not only possible, but in some sense, almost easy, right? That, 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 that the good becomes something that's, that's easy to do. Again, when we're steeped in sin, when we're steeped in the slavery of sin, if we think of kind of addiction, uh, we're not actually free to not choose whatever we're addicted to. Uh, whereas true freedom makes the good not only possible, uh, but, but easy and a delight to do. That's the goal of freedom is that the good things that we do aren't a burden. They're just naturally those things that come to mind uh, of what we should pursue. So if a student's walking down the hallway and they see someone drop their books, well, early on, it might be something where the student has to like, mentally struggle and tell themselves, okay, I'm not going to keep walking. I will help them pick up their books. And it's kind of a laborious process for them to kind of, should I keep walking with my friend? Should I stop? Well, that's not true. True freedom is recognizing the good of, I should help this person. And it almost becomes instinctual. It becomes habitual. It becomes second to our nature. This is how all virtue functions. The goal of virtue is that it becomes second nature. It becomes something that we can't help but do because it's so obvious to us the path we should pursue. That's true freedom. And that's the freedom we're forming these students in. So we're we're coming up near the end here, but I I think how I want to try to end is to get 
a personal view from you because you've you've given a really great sort of uh, overview of the different ways that the Chesterton Academy is forming the students for that brighter future. But h- how long have you been a headmaster? Remind me, please. This is my fifth year. Okay. So five years is a good amount of time. And from where you started year one as headmaster to where you are now year five as, as headmaster, can you give the audience sort of your view of what sort of witnessing this change, witnessing this formation within the students, what sort of has been your greatest observation? You know, because I'm sure you see things differently in your first year as headmaster because you're just trying to get a handle on everything. But then you start to watch your students, you start to watch them graduate, you start to hear back from them, you start to sort of get in a groove, if you will. And you're here, here you are now. What have you seen from year one to year five, that has really just been such a great thing for, for you and say, wow, this is, this is really amazing. One of the greatest gifts of this job is to see up close and personal how the Lord works on young people's hearts. And I think for me, this is the greatest, the greatest gift of this job, the greatest beauty that I see, oftentimes this working on the heart, you know, comes comes through tears and agony. I mean, the amount of times I've been sitting in my office and I've had the student on the other side of the desk uh, crying or worried about something or anxious or whatever it might be. But it's through these trials, it's through these difficulties that I see up close and personal the way that the Lord is working on this student's heart. And, and it's beautiful to see because the students, uh, through this formation we provide, through the formation their parents provide, they desire Christ. They desire to be close to him. They desire to grow in these ways. But that, as we all know, comes through a great deal of, of agony and, and struggle. Uh, Teresa of Avila famous said, famously said, uh, she was complaining to God. Uh, she said, God, if this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder you have so few of them. And I think it's something about seeing that process up close. And again, that long game, watching that transformation slowly take place. Again, first year as headmaster, again, you're, you're kind of jumping in and, and you're seeing uh, different aspects of it, but you don't really get to see the process play out over a number of years. You know, now in, in, in year five, and, and I pray for, for, for many, many more years to come, it's been neat over those five years to see the process play out in these students over the course of their four years at the Chesterton Academy and to see those hearts slowly transformed year after year, the transitions that take place between freshman and sophomore year and sophomore and junior year and junior and senior year. Uh, it's just a really, really rich thing. Uh, and something that I've grown to appreciate more and more is, is those moments I get with the students when I can, I can almost see Christ really working on their hearts. You know, I, I wish I could say that I was in your seat to sort of watch this sort of formation over the years, but I can say just from actual personal testimony, the the few students that I got to encounter on my visit to your your wonderful academy there, it was just sort of mind blowing. And to listen to them talk, to watch them in their expressions, to sort of sort of know that these students were in a particularly in a particular place. But not just, hey, these are good students. These are these are amazing people. Like to to see that their their personhood was shaped and formed over their time at Chesterton in such an obvious way. Uh, like I was just it it made me the only way I can explain it is like I was so ecstatic inside listening to some of your students talk. And I was so impressed. I was remember telling my telling my wife. I said, "You should hear the, these young people talk." I mean, from my perspective, they were defending a dissertation level of you know vo- of vocabulary, you know. And I, I I am so impressed and so amazed and so thankful for you know not just your academy, you know, but all the Chesterton academies that are doing the exact same thing everywhere. Yeah, they're they're beautiful kids. I mean, we're, we're so blessed with such incredible students here uh, at the Academy, such incredible alumni that I've been blessed to know. And that's one of the greatest treats for me is that by the time they graduate, we have a ritual at our graduation ceremony uh, where coming into the graduation mass and uh, baccalaureate exercises um, where the I lead the way, uh, followed by the faculty, followed by the seniors. 
Uh, but after they receive their diplomas, they lead the faculty out of the church um, and they become, I tell them at, at graduation, they become our colleagues now. You go from our students to our colleagues. And I've felt that over the years that not only do I just say that and say, okay, these are actually people I'd want to have be my colleagues as well. And I think that's the greatest delight is when I see these seniors graduate, um, I, they're, they're, you know, I, I love them as colleagues and I see them as colleagues and they're, they're good people um, with great joy and life. They come back and visit frequently whenever they're home on breaks. Um, and I always delight in sharing a meal with them, or having conversations with them, catching up with them. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the heart of it is that, that we're forming good people uh, who are going to be kind of attractive to the world around them because of their joy. What what a wonderful testament, you know, to sort of close up on is that you have students that come back to visit their their, their high school, basically. You know, I, I, I would love to run the numbers against every other institutional option and say, how many of those students are coming back and visiting with their teachers, with their faculty, uh, and are actually you know, caring individuals, you know, that, that makes a difference to them. Uh, because I would be willing to bet some money that, that Chesterton might be leading in a statistical way against, you know, every other educational institution when it comes to just students caring about where they came from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's beautiful to see and just the percentage of our students who, who, you know, come back on a yearly basis to, to visit, to sit in on classes, even that they've already taken just to be there and to be present with the other students, and the other teachers. Uh, it's, it's a delight. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have had the great joy of talking with Dr. Eric Demuse, headmaster of Chesterton Academy of Milwaukee. You have heard from him the great things that the Chesterton Academies are doing as you know, we are leading off of the Giving Tuesday campaign, you know, forming students for a brighter future. Truly, that is what is taking place. And if you have any interest in learning more about the Chesterton Academies, please go to their main website, uh, chestertonschoolsnetwork.org, and uh, query for some more information. Perhaps you feel in your heart, maybe you're in a different position of life, but you want to assist or help. Uh, lots of ways to do that. Again, go to chestertonschoolsnetwork.org uh, to learn more. Eric, thanks so much for taking some time this morning to talk with me and to talk with our audience about really what is happening on the insides of an academy and what the Chesterton Academies are doing to form students in such a brilliant manner. Thanks so much, Albert, for having me. It's been a delight. Uh, be assured of my prayers for all the work that you're doing here at the network. And uh, please, please pray for us here in Milwaukee. Consider it done. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Uncommon Sense. Be assured, more episodes to come. And remember, Chesterton is always better with friends. Talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.